I don't know about you guys, but I'm excited. Y'all excited? You ready to start this Easter series? All right, well, let's get started. How many of you remember Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, the show, children's show? Yeah, most of us. I mean, everybody knows who Mr. Rogers is. We all love Mr. Rogers. What you may not know is that in 1969, Mr. Rogers traveled to Washington, D.C. to testify before Congress because President Nixon had put forth a, a bill that would uh, eliminate all funding for public broadcasting. And this, the Senate was getting ready to confirm that and take away all of that funding. And so Mr. Rogers traveled and he testified before a Senate subcommittee with passion about why we needed funding to support shows that, particularly for kids, that educate kids, that teach them how to deal with their emotion. And this committee was ready to cut all the funding. But you can watch as Mr. Rogers testifies, he begins to win over the room. And you can see the, the mood begin to change in the room. You can actually go watch this at, on, on YouTube, and it's pretty cool, actually. Go back and watch it at some point. It's pretty neat. But he ends his testimony by quoting one of the poems that he wrote for kids that he used on his show. And it was this poem about how to deal with anger and how to process your anger. And man, is he is quoting that poem, you can just feel he's now winning the room. And when he finishes his poem, the, the Senate subcommittee chairman looks at him and says, Mr. Rogers, it looks like you just earned $20 million. And the room erupted in clapping and cheering that this had happened. You know, when, when it happened, nobody looked over at their staffer and said, Mr. Rogers has gotten too powerful. We've got to do something about Rogers. He dies tonight. Right? Nobody said that. We were all rooting for Mr. Rogers. They were excited, even though he was challenging the president and Congress of the United States. So why was it so different for Jesus? Why was he killed? Why was it different? Remember, this is the Jesus who taught about love and humble service. This is the Jesus that healed the sick, took care of the poor, welcomed kids. He had no home. He had no wealth. He had no army. He was all about humility and humble service. He stood up against the government of his nation, and they wanted him dead. So why is it different for Jesus? We talk a lot in church about why Jesus had to die, right? From a theological perspective, why it was necessary for him to die. And if you've been around church a while, you know what this is. We'll, I'm going to give you the nickel version of the theology of Jesus' death on the cross. The problem we have is that we worship a perfect God, and we're a very imperfect people. We all have sin that separates us from God. Romans 3.23 says it this way, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And because of that sin, and we worship a perfect God, a righteous God, a just God, there has to be punishment for that sin. And so look at what the wages, look at what the price is for our sin. In Romans 6, 23, it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So because of our sin, what we earned was death. But Jesus steps in our place and he suffered that death for us. In other words, the God had the judgment, our God had the judgment of sin, but our God also took the punishment of that sin, which is pretty cool if you think about it. And listen to how 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We understand as Christians why Jesus' death on the cross is so important. But that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about not why did Jesus have to die from a theological perspective, but why did the Jewish people and the Jewish leaders, why did they want him dead? Why did they kill him? Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open those up to John chapter 14. Today we're kicking off a brand new sermon series that I'm really excited about called Death to Life. And we're looking at some of the very last teaching of Jesus right before he goes to the cross. And I'm so excited to see what God is going to do in these weeks leading up to Easter and coming out of Easter. Uh, a couple of months ago, it became very clear to me that God wanted to do something different in this sermon series, that this wasn't just another sermon series, that this was a moment in time where God wanted to grow our church in a new and different way. And, and let me be clear, I'm not one of those people that talks to God all the time in the sense that I feel like God is talking to me in words or very clear uh, ideas. That actually is fairly rare for me, but this was one of those moments. And so then I started thinking about the individual sermons, 
And God began to give me a message that he wants you to hear, some different ideas and concepts. And we were on an airplane back in January. We had gone up to see my granddaughter, and we were flying back, and all of a sudden, I just started having ideas for this series, for the individual sermons. And so I pull out my iPhone, because I got nothing else with me, and I start typing notes on the little iPhone. And let me be clear, I don't like typing on an iPhone. These fingers are not made to type sermons on iPhones. But I started typing that out, and, and I've never been given a sermon message out of order like that. I hadn't even started writing the sermons for the last series for our marriage series. And, and so that was very different for me. And, and then a couple of weeks later, I woke up in the middle of the night with a burden to pray for our church, to pray that we would have a different level of passion for God, that we would have a desperation for God. And I shared that message with my wife, and we began to pray together for our church. And then I talked to the staff, and as a staff, we started praying a different kind of prayer that God would transform us to be a people who are desperate for God, that our church would take the priorities of God and make them our passion. And so for weeks now, we've been praying. And what's cool is that we're already seeing God move as we pray. A lot of you guys I know are praying too. Last Sunday, if you missed last Sunday, you missed a pretty powerful moment when a lot of the men of our church came right down here and prayed desperately for God to move in their families and God to move in this church and that they would be the leader that God has called them to be. And then on Wednesday night, our men fasted. We had a number of men that fasted all day, and then we gathered at 6.30, broke fast together, and then we prayed. And there were more tears on Wednesday night as we prayed passionately and desperately for our church. And I would invite you to be a part of that. The whole church now, next, this week, is invited to fast on Wednesday and then come break fast at 6.30 and pray together desperately for God to move in our church. And, and so here's my hope and my prayer for you over the next few weeks, that God would make you passionate for him, that, that he would make his priorities your passions and you would begin to live out your faith. Each of these sermons, all the way up through Easter, are going to kind of build on one another. So each week, we're going to kind of take the next step through this process. And so here's my challenge and my encouragement. Try to be here every week. And I say that knowing full well, you know what next Sunday is, right? Time change Sunday. I'm sorry to bring up that difficult topic, but it's true. I know that hurts church attendance. And if that's not bad enough, I know it's rodeo weekend. I also know it's the beginning of spring break. I know all of those things. I call that over the years the triple whammy of church attendance whenever we have that, that Sunday. But I want to challenge you to think a little differently. Even if it means just to tweak your plans a little or it means just getting up earlier on a time change Sunday than you really want to and try to be here for that. If you can't be here, I want to challenge you to go back and watch the sermon from the week before. And so you can stay up to speed with what we're doing. But be praying desperately that God would work in your life and in the life of of our church. All right, well, let's dive into the sermon for today. The teaching for today takes place right after the, the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, where Jesus celebrates the Passover meal with his disciples, and he washes their feet to show them how to love and to care for one another. And then he tells them that he's about to die, and that one of them is going to betray him. Well, as you can imagine, man, they are worried and they're, and they're concerned about their future. And listen to what God tells them. This is John 14, 1 through 6. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? So he's talking about heaven here. And it's clear from the way he says it that he's talked to his disciples about heaven before. And he says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you with me that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So you got to love doubting Thomas here. <laughs> like Jesus is talking about this topic of how to get home to heaven. How does that work? And it's a topic he's taught on to his disciples before. And none of them know what he's talking about. They got no clue. 
But I'm sure I can just see them all. They're shaking their head, trying to be the teacher's pet, pretending like they know exactly what Jesus is talking about. Except Doubting Thomas. He's like, oh, oh, oh. We have no idea what you're talking about. We don't know where you're going, so we don't have any way to get there. And, and so Jesus could have gotten upset here because these are the men that are going to be leading his church in just a few short weeks. And he doesn't. Instead, he makes this very profound statement about who he is. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so he is telling them this incredible truth that he is God. He's saying, I am the only way to have real meaning and purpose in this life. I am the only way to have a connection that's eternal with the Father. I'm the way. And so I want to break down this I am statement by Jesus. And I think when we go through this, you're going to understand why they wanted him dead. Look at the first part. He says, I am the way. Jesus is saying that he is the very center of our faith, that everything revolves around him. He is saying that he is the way to find purpose in this life. He's the way to get home. But to understand the impact of that statement, you've got to know what was going on in Israel at that time. Their religion was centered around following the Old Testament law, being good enough for God by trying to be faithful to the, all that law. And so it was, you worked very hard. And, and so they built this system around the more righteous you were, the more you followed the law, the more you were respected, the more authority you were given. And so that was the system that was in place. And so the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees, who were the, they were the main religious leaders of that time, you got to understand, they had a lot invested in that system because they were more righteous than everybody else. They followed the law better than anybody. In fact, they followed this law so well that they kept making up new law that wasn't in the Bible just to make sure they won the game of righteousness. So you could be talking to a Pharisee or a Sadducee about following the Ten Commandments and you could feel pretty good about yourself. And then they'd tell you about codicils, and they would tell you about subcommandments you'd never even heard before that they were following. You didn't even know they existed. And so at the end of the conversation, it was very clear that they were more righteous than you, or at least that's how it looked. And so then because they had all this good stuff, this righteousness on their resume, they had acquired power and authority and respect and money. And Jesus suddenly is threatening all of that, and they don't like it. Because anybody can follow Jesus if you're connected to him. See, Jesus threatens it because he says that the way is not about what you do, it's about who you know. The way to righteousness is through relationship. And so because of that, all of the education that these guys had didn't matter as much anymore. All of the family and social connections and political connections that they had didn't matter as much anymore because anybody can choose to have this relationship with Jesus. And so they're not very happy with that. The primary thing that separates us from finding the way home is our sin. We have a basic sin problem and Jesus is the connection or he is the way to get home because he's the bridge between us and a perfect God. And so in the Old Testament, what the priests did is they make these temporary sacrifices for the people's sin, and they had this big book of law that they followed, and it was all about how well you tried to follow the law. But when Jesus came, he changed all of that. He now said, it's about relationship with Jesus. He says, it is all about who you know and who you follow. He freed us from the law, and he made a way for us to be redeemed and forgiving. For those of you that think there are a lot of different ways to get to a relationship with God and a way to get home to heaven other than Jesus, let me ask you a tough question. Why would Jesus have gone to the hardship and the suffering of the cross if he was just adding one more way to get home? Think about that. Jesus left heaven, the perfection of heaven. He came and became a man. He lived a life of humble service where he had felt sickness and pain for the first time. Ultimately, he would be humiliated. He would be beaten. He would be taunted and mocked and nailed to a cross to die a very slow death of asphyxiation or not being able to breathe. 
Like if there were other ways for people to have a relationship with God and get home, why would he have done that? And then think about this. Jesus' closest followers on earth were ultimately also thrown in jail. They were beaten. They were killed. And, and Jesus told them to reject the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and instead to follow him. Now, why would Jesus have done that to his very closest friends? They were already following the Jewish law. That's what they were doing already. And so that if that was still a way to get home, why would Jesus tell them to do something different? He tried very hard then to fix something that was, wasn't really broken, right? There's this old East Texas saying, uh, the wise saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But Jesus did all of that not because he is making one more way to get home, but because he is making the way to get home. See, Jesus upsets the apple cart because he teaches that salvation is now through grace and faith. Our faith in God gives us the grace of God. So all of the the hard work and all of the effort that these guys had made to memorize all the Old Testament law didn't matter as much anymore because Jesus is moving us from moral action to heart's affection. He's saying heart's affection is the way home. It's a life-changing relationship with him. And, And see, here's the real problem with trying to earn your way home through following the law or the Ten Commandments. You can't keep the Ten Commandments. And neither can I. You can't even keep the first commandment, and neither can I. We mess that up over and over and over again. The first commandment says, have no other gods before me. What does that mean? Don't have idols. Don't have things that are more important than God. Do you have things that you spend more time and resources and energy on than God? Hobbies, work, family, all those different things? Of course you do, and so do I. We fail the very first commandment. And so when we understand that we cannot earn our way to salvation, it should give us a desperation for relationship with God. See, the way is not adding Jesus somewhere down on your priority list, uh, you know, showing up at church and adding that into your busy schedule of all the other things going on. That's not the way. The way isn't about what you do. The way isn't even about what you know. Do you know that demons have better theology than you do? They were there when God created the heavens and the earth. They didn't just read about it. They saw it. They know way more about God's character. They have seen him. They understand his character way better than you. So if it comes down to what you know, they got it that one. But the deal is they don't follow the way because they haven't submitted to the lordship and rule of Jesus Christ. What does Jesus want from us? He he wants us to see everything that the world has to offer. And, and, and then say, I put you higher up. You are above all of that. And look, I'm not just talking about the bad stuff, the sinful stuff. I'm talking about the good stuff too. Career, family, wealth, all those things that we look at. He wants to, just to see all of those things and still put him first. The way is found by passionately chasing a life-altering relationship with Jesus. And, and some of you are like, whoa, 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 whoa preacher. That, you're asking too much. Surely... God doesn't really expect to be first, but he does. And he says that over and over in the Bible. And if we're really honest with ourselves, we'd expect nothing less. Do you remember the movie uh, Ocean's Eleven? Y'all remember that? It's about this very wealthy uh, casino owner named Benedict. He's got all this wealth and power. He's also uh, dating and and got a fiance that's uh, Julia Roberts. And so it looks like a pretty good deal going for him. Wealth and Julia Roberts sounds like a pretty good gig. But the problem becomes is that Danny Ocean is a character played by George Clooney. He also wants Tess that's played by Julia Roberts. And so he puts together this team, and through this elaborate plan, they steal most of Benedict's wealth. And, And so as you can imagine, Benedict is not very happy about that. And so then, late in the movie, in this confrontational scene, this climactic scene, George Clooney's character, Danny Ocean, confronts Benedict, and he gives him a choice. He says, look, I'll give you back all your money if you give back Tess. Right? He's putting his two great loves to compete with one another, wealth and Julia Roberts. And Benedict says, 
I'll take the money. Now, what Benedict doesn't know is that Julia Roberts was actually watching this confrontation on the security cameras for the casino. And you can just see her face change as she hears Benedict make the choice of money over her. And we were all with her. Nobody was in the theater thinking, you know, well, that is a lot of money. No, we were saying, Get, you dump him. He doesn't love you first. If he cared about you, he would have chosen you. Can you imagine somebody proposing to their, to their girlfriend and saying, I want you to marry me. I love you a lot. You're second in my heart, right behind my money. We wouldn't do that because we know that's not true love. The way to get home is having a relationship with Jesus that's different than everything else, that defines everything about who you are. And the early church understood that this was the way. Did you know that they were actually called followers of the way? The reason is because they understood from the teaching of the apostles that Jesus was the one way to get home. Jesus is the way. Now let's look at the second part of this Jesus statement in John 14, 6. He says, I am the truth. That's a very different statement than we would expect to hear from a religious leader. I can tell you I know the truth because I've read the Bible and I've seen God's word to us in the Bible, but I certainly can't say I am the truth. And in this statement, when Jesus says he is the truth, it's a unique claim that he is God. And this claim by Jesus brings up a really interesting issue about truth. Like, what is truth? And how can we even really know what it is? This issue actually comes up in the Bible just shortly after this I am statement. Jesus is arrested and he's standing trial before Pilate, who is the Roman governor of the area. And the Roman governor, Pilate, is trying to figure out if Jesus is claiming to be a king that threatens the rule of the Roman Empire. And, and look at how... Jesus responds to him. This is John 18, 36 through 38. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Listen to what Pilate says. What is truth? Maybe a question that a lot of you have asked. He's like, is there really even truth? Is that a thing? The world tells us that truth is whatever we believe. That's our preferences. It's our uh, priorities. That's our unique perspective. There, there's my truth and there's your truth. And either one of them are okay because it's our truth. But that can't be right. Truth is truth. It shouldn't change depending on what you think or what I think. And here's why this is kind of a ridiculous concept when we think about it, is if we have different truth, there is no truth, right? There is not an absolute. There's no right or wrong. There's just our own preferences and beliefs and convictions. Here, here's another problem with this idea that there are different truths. Our idea of truth as a society has changed pretty dramatically over the years. Now, let me give you one little example. When I went to high school and college, I was taught that the British Empire that existed really at its height in the 18th and 19th century, that it was mostly good, that they did some bad stuff, that they hurt some people along the way, but ultimately it was very good for the world because they brought better education and healthcare and peaceful government. And where we are today is in large part due to the, the British Empire. Well, when my kids got to high school and college, had changed. The, the truth had changed. And they were taught that every empire is ultimately evil. That the British Empire did very little good and that it was just an evil ruling of other people. Well, the truth about the British Empire didn't change from 200 years ago. Just our perception of that truth changed. Also, our individual concept of truth changes over time. I, I see things very different today than I did as a child. In college, my concept of truth changed as I was listening to professors and stuff, and my concept of truth has changed again as I've aged. And if I'm real honest with you, my concept of truth has changed a little bit since I woke up this morning. If I'd have been preaching this sermon at 6 a.m. when I first got up, it would have been a much harsher and grumpier sermon than it is now. But our concept of truth is always changing. And if truth changes, 
then it's not really truth. See, that's why it's so important that we re- rely not on our own concepts of truth, but we understand that Jesus is truth, and we rely on him. That truth never changes. He is the true north that we can direct our lives by. He is the truth today, yesterday, and a thousand years from now. Never changes. He is truth. Jesus is the way to God because he is the truth of God. Jesus is the picture of God that we get to see. We get to see a little bit of God's holiness, his mercy, his love. His compassion, all those truths about God we get to see in Jesus. Listen to how Colossians 1.15 says it. It says, the Son is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the truth about God that we get to see. Here's why this idea that Jesus is truth is so important. It means that the only true measure of righteousness is Jesus. Here's how we usually measure our righteousness. We look around at other people and we offer up their unrighteousness to God and compare it to our righteousness. We look at the neighbor down the street or the person across the aisle in church and we say, I'm pretty righteous because, man, I'm more righteous than them. But what the Bible says is that man-made righteousness, our attempts to be righteous, wholly fail. The prophet Isaiah said that they're worthless rags. The only true righteousness that God will accept is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He's the standard. Because when we, and here's why this is such a big deal, why the good news is so good for us. When we follow the truth of Jesus, we're given the righteousness of Jesus, and that gives us the way home to Jesus. That's how that works. Some of you may wonder why I'm I'm comfortable standing up here as your pastor and telling you that my marriage was pretty bad early on. I mean, we had several years that was bad. I'm comfortable telling you that 20 years ago, I wasn't a good husband or a good father. Why am I comfortable telling you that? Because I'm not the truth. I'm not the true measure of righteousness. All I do as your pastor is point you to the truth of Jesus so that you can find the way home. That is the only measure that we have. All I can do is show you the truth of God so that you can get the righteousness of Jesus and find the way home. See, he is truth. Everything that you're looking for can be found in him. All of your questions can be answered by him. Jesus is truth. All right, let's look at the last part of this I am statement in John 14, 6. Jesus says, I am the life. In the last part of this I am statement, he's saying, you you think you know what life is? You're chasing after what you think is life, but you actually have no idea what true life is. Jesus says it this way uh, in Matthew 10, 38 through 39. He says, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. This, This seems like an odd statement when we first read it. If we find life, we lose it. But but if we lose life, then we find it. What does that mean? Here's what he means by that. He says, the things that you can see and touch that feel real to you aren't really life. That he is life. Success, comfort, wealth, fame, all of those things are not where you find true life. You chase after those things and they promise you happiness. They promise you purpose. But they fail to deliver. And ultimately, they'll lead to death. Let me be honest with you for a second. You cannot find purpose and joy and satisfaction in things you already have, but just think you need more of, right? In other words, if money doesn't bring you satisfaction and joy now, why do you think making more money will bring you satisfaction and joy? Things that don't bring you purpose and comfort now are not going to bring you more comfort. You can look at that and find that it's true when you see that some of the most unhappy people are some of the most wealthy people. And see, when you're trying to chase things that aren't bringing you joy and purpose in life, you're just running on a treadmill. You're working really hard, but you're not getting anywhere. And Jesus is saying, let go of all of that. That's not life. I am life. This life is not our ultimate goal. It is not the end of the story. It's just a little drop in the ocean of eternity. It's just the first hundred meters of a marathon. And Jesus is saying, focus way less on that. Live a life here 
that has eternal consequences, that has eternal significance. Jesus is offering us a life that has an eternal impact, not just to us, but also to the people around us. And he's saying, if you want to try find full, fulfilling, purposeful life, a life that's richer and more abundant, follow me. Give up all those other things and follow me. But we're so tempted to follow the things of this world rather than Jesus. You know, what breaks my heart as your pastor is to hear from people that they're disappointed that, that Jesus isn't working for them. And, and I know exactly the problem. It's never really been Jesus. That they're king of their own life. That they won't give up control. They're not bowing down to a king. And then they're disappointed and disillusioned that Jesus isn't working for them. That he's not accomplishing what they want him to accomplish. He's not transforming their family and giving them a meaningful life. They, they've never really surrendered to Jesus. Or, or maybe they've surrendered a little, but they've held back a lot. And that doesn't really work. So as your pastor... I'm try, trying to help you change that. As your pastor, I want to move you from the category of decided to the category of discipled. See, so many of you are in this decided category. You made a decision to follow Jesus. Maybe you've been baptized. You come to church. But it's never really changed the way that you live. You've never given up lordship of your life to King Jesus. And so I'm trying to move you from this series from decided to discipled. Because it's only in that moment where you can begin to experience the true life that Jesus offered. You need to make Jesus not just your Savior, but your Lord and your King. Did you guys watch Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade? Did you see that? It should have been the Last Crusade, but they still made two more movies. But well, that's a different sermon for a different day. But in that movie, there's the girl who is kind of playing both sides of the fence. She's working with Indiana Jones when she thinks it'll help her get the Holy Grail. But if she thinks the, the, the evil Nazis are going quicker, then she'll switch over and start working with them. Toward the end of the movie, the, the Holy Grail or this cup of life, it falls into this crevice and she jumps in after it to try to, to save this cup of life. And, and she, she was about to fall right off this little ledge down to her death. And Indiana Jones reaches down and grabs her hand. But she's stretching out. She's trying to reach this cup of life, this, this cup that is going to give her fame and fortune. That's going to give her significance because she will have recovered this amazing artifact. And, and Indiana's like, you're about to die. Hold on to my hand. Grab my hand with both hands. Let me save you. But she keeps stretching out, trying to get to what she thought was life. And, and she falls to her death. And when that happens, then Indiana falls down into the crevice. And his father reaches out and takes his hand. But Indiana sees that same cup that will bring him a life of fame and fortune. He'll be the greatest archaeologist of all time. It will bring him purpose. And so he's reaching out and his hand is starting to slip out of his father's hand. And he keeps reaching and his, and his dad is yelling at him. And finally, his dad just says his name. Indiana, let it go. And suddenly Indiana lets go of trying to reach the cup. And he grabs his father's hand and his father pulls him up to safety. What he thought was life was about to kill him. But it was the Father's hand that saved him. And see, that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, let it go. Let go of all the things that you're reaching out for, that you're chasing after. Take my hand and find true life in the hand of the Father. That's what it looks like. The things in this life that are so glittery, so enticing, those things will ultimately fade, and you'll fade with it. Those things that seem like life, ultimately lead to death. So let go of those transient things and grab a hold of life that's true life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the lie. Listen to how Thomas Akempis, a 15th century Christian scholar, he expands on this I am statement in a very poetic and beautiful way. He says, follow thou me. I am the way and the truth and the life. Without the way, there is no going. Without the truth, there is no knowing. Without the life, there is no living. I am the way which thou must follow, the truth which thou must believe, the life for which thou must hope. I am the inviolable way, the sovereign truth, and the blessed life. That's what Jesus is offering to us. But the price isn't cheap. It's full surrender to a king. You may be thinking, is that too much to ask? Not when you realize that your king suffered and died for you 
before you even know who he was. The king died for his subjects. And isn't that the kind of king that we want? So why, why did they want him dead? Well, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders, they didn't want a king. They liked the way things were. You know, they were willing to accept Jesus on their terms. They were letting, they'd willing to give him a little power. They'd let him be on committees. Maybe they'd let him chair a committee or two. But they didn't want to bow down to a king because they didn't give, want to give up the wealth and the power and the authority that they had based on the way things were. If Jesus was just willing to play by their rules, they'd be okay with him. And then for the common Jewish people, it was a little different. They were willing to accept King Jesus as long as Jesus was willing to overthrow the Roman Empire. They wanted a king who would do what they wanted him to do. But once they realized that that wasn't his purpose, they lost interest. And here's the difficult truth for us. We still kill King Jesus today. We, we limit his authority. We want to go our own way. We want to say, great, I'm glad you're here. Give me what I want, but I'm not willing to give that up. What we really want is for Jesus to serve us. And, and if we're really honest, we want to make him our errand boy or our butler, where we serve him a few times by coming to church and then we ring the little bell and he shows up to bail us out of a problem or to get us a raise or a promotion at work or make somebody well again. And, and then we're disappointed with Jesus when he doesn't move on our timeline. But see, that's not the relationship that Jesus wants. He, he didn't come to be a vo- motivational speaker or self-help promoter. He didn't come to play a little part in your life on Sunday mornings. He didn't come to be a get-out-of-jail-free card for you when things go bad. He wants to be your Lord and King. And you've got to decide whether that's too much to ask. But your King died for you. He is a righteous and perfect King. And isn't that the King we want? Isn't that who we follow? Our hearts long for a true King. A King that will step in, make things right, conquer evil, and bring peace to the world. You know, the first time Jesus came, he came as a humble servant to pay the price of your sin. But when he returns, he will come as a mighty king to set things right, to overcome evil, and to bring peace to his creation. That's the culmination of the great story that God's writing. From the very beginning of Genesis, we've been waiting on a king to to conquer evil, to crush the head of the serpent, and to bring peace to God's people. That's what Jesus is. And in his statement... I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's saying, I'm the king that you've been waiting for. I'm the righteous God that you've been waiting. Look, deep down, that's what we want. Our hearts long for a true king, a king that will conquer evil and set things right. You know, that is what we want. It's what we read about. It's what we watch. Think about this. Where does your movie dollars go? Does it go to those sad, well-directed, well-acted movies that win Oscars? where the main character dies of something at the end. No, we go and we want to see this great story of a great hero. We want to see the Avengers. We want to see Harry Potter. Think about Harry Potter's story for just a minute. He dies for the people of Hogwarts. He comes back to life. He overthrows Voldemort. He defeats evil and brings peace back. Does that sound a little familiar? We want Lord of the Rings, where Aragorn steps out of the shadows, takes his rightful place as king, Saves the world of man and takes the throne. Give me Luke Skywalker that fights Darth Vader and the emperor and defeats evil for us. We've spent billions of dollars watching this same story over and over and over again. Why do we do that? Because deep down, we long for that kind of leadership. We long for that kind of king. A righteous and worthy king is in our DNA. In this statement, I am the truth and the life and the way. Jesus is saying, that longing in your heart is good, and I'm the king you've been waiting for to change your story. See, we all worship something. We all bow down to something. But who or what we bow down to makes all the difference. Let's pray.